Let me close that door. I don't know what it is, but sitting up front in a class, the lightest noise in the hall just is really distracting for me. So I don't know if it bothers any of you folks, but it drives me crazy. All right. Um, one thing that we did not talk about when we talked about ASP.NET controls, one thing that I didn't mention, it's sort of implied, but I want to make sure I say it explicitly and, and talk a little bit about what, what that means, is that ASP.NET controls maintain state. Okay? What does it mean when I say that the controls maintain state? How would you describe that? Any, any thoughts? If you're to give something to the controller, it has the capability of remembering that? Exactly. When you talk about state, you're talking about remembering from one request to another. So we talked a little bit about the form uh, cycle last time where you load a form, you put an answer in a text box, for example, like in our quiz, you press submit, you're actually making another request to the server, you're posting back to itself, and all the controls will still have their attributes that they had before. That's what we mean by maintaining state. And it's, it's important to realize that that happens, uh, and that's, that's a good thing, right? Um, anyone that do, has done coding on other platforms know that you don't always get that. All right, you don't get that maintaining of state. For example, if you were writing code in PHP where you had a page post back to itself, it won't necessarily automatically remember the value of a text box, for example. You may have to write code to, to set it back. Um, so, in fact, you would have to write code to, to set the value back. So that is, that, that's, a, that's a good thing and, and a neat feature. Um, what I want to do today is, is twofold. We'll, we'll, we'll cover a couple examples. And again, the theme is going to be um, to um, take and be able to program our controls. In other words, we have these ASP.NET controls. We're going to explore some of them, maybe explore a few different ones that we've done before, maybe look at some different validations or whatever. But um, the, 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 the other part of the focus is going to be, yeah, we can program them. In other words, the attributes which we can define originally, we can manipulate, the, manipulate those attributes on the fly through our code based on certain conditions. And the example that we had last time was a little quiz example. Let me go and open up this. Speaking of naps. I did mention to whoever I think I was supposed to mention to that we need a new computer down here. So don't know if we'll get it this semester or not. The first control that we're going to look at today, we're going to expand our quiz to have panels. And the idea of a panel is like this, uh, especially if you wanted a page to work in a couple different modes. If you, for example, had page, uh, a page that, that showed the different um, CISS programs. You might have a networking uh, a page a, uh, or a networking section, a web development section, a software development section, a mobile software development section. You could actually, through showing and hiding different panels, you could show and hide different content that was, was on there. And the nice thing is about a panel is that um, with a panel, you only have to show or hide one thing. And everything on that panel will either be shown or hidden. So here's our quiz from last time. And I'm going to run it. Yeah. There's nothing to see yet. <laughs> It's preparing solution. It's really thinking about this hard. Did 
Did I talk in this class about having um, sponsorship and advertisements? Mm -hmm. This would be a great spot for a commercial. We could, we could say, and now a word from our sponsor and have, you know, a couple minute ad. All right. Here's our quiz that we had last time. And our page, again, right now has um, one addition problem. It has a button to show or hide uh, the answer, or to show the answer, rather. Um, it has a button where we can put in our answer and check the answer, all right, and, and so on. Uh, what I want to do um, is I want to put code in here so that I could have maybe a, subst a subtraction quiz as well. And by clicking the button, you could either see the subst subtraction or the addition. Now, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Uh, with this, you know, the coding would be basically the same except for that. But what I am going to do is the show and hide on panels bit. So what I'm going to do is, again, you can do this a couple different places. Um, I go, uh, I, I'm going to go into uh, the, the code view, the source code view. And I'm going to drag a panel over. And I'm then going to put that, all this stuff, in my first panel, all right, which has an ID of panel one. All right. And from a visual perspective, that doesn't really do anything for it. But now it's part of an ASP.NET control that I can wholesale hide or show and makes it easier than showing and hiding the individual controls. Now if I add two or three different questions on here, um, I don't have to worry about going back and hiding them individually. I could then go to um, and add another panel. All right. And this would be where my sub subtraction quiz would appear. And I'm just going to put an H1 subtraction quiz. Let's look and see what the issue is here. This end tag has no matching start tag. Yes, it does. I wonder if it's just a little behind. At any rate, let's go and run, um, let's go and make that tag, or make that panel rather, invisible. So I'll say visible equals false on it. Go up here. I think I have a nesting problem. That's what I have. And I can say visible equals true. I can then add my buttons. A button to add, a button to subtract. To show that quiz. Um, and now I have to write a code behind to actually make these work. So I'm setting the attributes of these up initially as part of the code. And I could, again, either do it in the source view or go into the, the visual uh, view, the design view. Um, I can then go and on the button add, click, I can say panel one visible equals true. Panel one, vi uh, panel two rather visible equals false. And then um, I can do the same thing for 
the subtract one except flipping which one I'm showing and hiding. All right, so I go and run this now. And initially those controls are going to have the values that I've given them, right? And they will remember that as long as, you know, it has state. But I can then go and change those attributes, the visibility attribute, dynamically based on which button I click. And really any property that you set on an attribute, you can set via, um, via, the, um, uh, via your code in addition to setting it in the property window or when you create the tag. All right. So it's going to come up and initially the add quiz panel is going to be visible and the subtraction one will be invisible. And I can go and do my thing um, and, and I could answer the addition one. You know, I can do all of that. Show answer correct. Then I can click the subtract one. And when I show add, notice that everything that was there is, is still there. All right. So again, I can dynamically show and hide the panel. So this would have been, and again, I didn't necessarily expect you to do it this way, but this could have been a way that you did the, the first example or the first homework assignment is, do that, uh, is to do this. Um, this might be a good way to do the second one where you have to show a login screen and if they've logged in successfully, then show a result screen that says, hey, they, they, they passed uh, the exam or, or uh, they passed the uh, um, criteria and they've registered. One thing I mentioned last time, and to reiterate, by making it invisible, it's not as though it sends that div to the browser with simply the visibility set to, to false via CSS. The server side control uh, just doesn't generate HTML if you, if you set it to be not visible on the server side. It's a subtle difference, right? The implication of that is, is to show it, I have to go back to the server and say make this visible. All right. Compare that with some other solutions that you might have where you would use JavaScript and you would through CSS set the visibility to something as false. All right. And through, if you do that, then the browser actually delivers all the divs, even the invisible ones, and the browser then can dynamically show or hide that based on JavaScript. Um, this would be an example of, of that, this page. All right. A little bit of, of lag here, but as we go and we put our mouse over this, Notice that that changes. That's happening without going back to the server. That's a different technique. In that case, all of those divs for each of the little submenus are delivered as HTML. They are just simply set invisible via CSS. And then JavaScript dynamically turns them on or off. The, the technique I showed, <coughs> excuse me, is a little bit different, whereas via my server-side code, I'm turning on and off those panels, which means that that server-side control, if it's set to invisible, will not generate the corresponding HTML for it. All right, so subtle point, but it's important to, to remember. One of the key things um, in, in, in becoming a web developer for these web applications is really keeping straight what is happening when, all right? how the flow works and how the server side does its thing, produces HTML and JavaScript to the client, and then the client can run that in the browser. And when's it going back to the server? When's it running on the client? You really got to be aware of that. It, it, uh, it gets to be confusing from time to time, especially um, you know, as you're starting out with this. Any questions on this example? So we did some basic little programming of a few little controls. I'd like to do another similar example. Uh, to this. All right. I'll save this. And what I want to do is I want to talk about what we're going to do 
and then we'll actually go and do it. And I want to do a little bit of planning, whereas um, we, we sort of think through um, what we've done, um, you know, and, and see if we can identify what controls we're going to need and, and what we're going to need to do to do this. All right. What I want to do is I want to calculate um, someone's um, bill at a restaurant. Okay? And I want to I want to do it this way. All right? If you go to a restaurant Here's your total bill. Actually, I shouldn't say total bill. Here's the bill for your food and beverages. There's a choice whether you dine in or take out. Right? And the implication of that is you pay sales tax on one but not the other. I forget how it goes. You pay sales tax for dining in, right? I think. All right. So. We want to be able to distinguish between whether we dine in or take out. We also want to um, figure um, the level of service that we received. All right? Either carry out, or, I'm sorry, if, it, if it's not carry out, we want to say was the service um, good? Or excellent, average, or poor. And we'll give, let's say, a 0% tip if it's poor service, a 15% tip if it is average service, and a 20% tip if it's good service. All right? I guess we'll add a not applicable one as well in case it's carry out. All right. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to have a button that says go and calculate. And it will go and it will calculate the total and it will display it in a box. All right. Now we may work on this and refine it. The first, <coughs> how do I want to say this? Our first pass at doing this won't necessarily be the perfect implementation of this. We'll sort of grow our solution. All right. What are we going to need in order to do this? Well, we're going to need some labels. Okay. That's, you know, um, pretty straightforward. For the total bill, we could have just a text box, right? Because we, we want to allow someone to type anything in. Now, we know chances are that the amount of the bill, well, we know it's not going to be a negative number, right? You, you go to the restaurant, you know, you're not being paid $5 to eat an order of fries, right? So we want to make sure that the bill is a positive number. So we want to make sure that the bill is greater than zero. And for the sake of argument here, we want to make sure the bill is less than $100. You can tell I don't eat it at fancy places, right? So we'll say that the, the bill has to be between zero and a hundred dollars. All right? And you have to enter a value for that. All right? Are we going to have then, would we want to have a text box for dine-in versus take-out? Would we want to have a text box for that? No. Why not? Because, because why? You could type anything in. You could type in uh, take-away, take-out, carry-out, carry-away eat at home, whatever, all right? What would we want to have instead? All right, we could do this a couple different ways. Let's say, since you said radio buttons, let's use radio buttons. So we'll have radio buttons. Now the whole point of a radio button, if you remember from HTML, is that you can only pick one or the other. As you click one, the other one goes off, all right? And that's a good control to use, um, if, if the, the, the number of alternatives are limited. What's another control that we could use instead of radio button? We could use a checkbox, right? Dine in, we could check it. If it was unchecked, it was implied that it's carry out. What would be another control we could use? 
a drop down and have the solution. Which is the best? I don't know. All right. Uh, certainly if there's a lot of options, you probably wouldn't want to use a radio button. You couldn't use a checkbox, right? You can only use a checkbox if it's sort of a yes or no type question, if there's two options. Radio buttons usually work if there's only a handful of options. And if there's a lot of options, you know, then you need to use a drop down. So we'll, for, for, uh, just for demonstration purposes, we will use uh, radio buttons for one. And then we'll use a drop down for the level of service. Okay? Either NA, poor, average, or good. All right? And we'll, 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 we'll calculate the, the uh, amount of the tip accordingly. All right. So let's go in and let's create our page. We'll call it Bill Calc. Yeah, exactly. And we'll create our page. Again, we'll, we'll, if there's only one page in your app, call it default. Have at least one default page. One page called default. Or have a page called default. You can't have at least one page. Um, that will serve to be the home page. I'm going to take a little minute to style this form um, just because um, I think that's important to do. All right. Um, typically, the way I do forms is I do them with uh, list items. I do it with an unordered list and, and a list item. So we'll go and we'll style it that way. Those of you who had me for 216 probably recall that, um, but this would be a good chance to review. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create my list item, or my unordered list rather. And each list item is going to be one of the controls. So I will have four list items. And I'm going to put labels here. In terms of accessibility, I'm going to use actually the label tag, which is a different um, label tag than the ASP label tag. This is uh, uh, an HTML uh, label tag. All right. We'll add those in a second. Let me go in and drag my text box over here. And I'm going to call this TXT Food. And then I'm going to go label for equals txt food. Does anyone recall why we do this? What's the purpose of the label tag?
Pardon me? Actually, no, this, 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 this is not an ASP.NET control, so it won't have anything to do with, with coding on the other end. Um, this is for accessibility. Um, will it show that label right next to the text box? Well, it will show it right next to the text box based on how we position it. What the label tag does is it allows a screen reader to associate the text with the text box. So in other words, if we go and look at this form, people that can see know that this label belongs to this text box. Remember what a screen reader does. A screen reader literally reads the controls on the page down to a user. It may be very difficult for someone using a screen reader to access the site, a visually impaired person um, that's accessing this using a screen reader isn't going to be able to visually associate that label with it. So the label tag allows us to do that. The label tag allows us to say, hey, this text belongs with this form control. Now, how, is, how do we know that this is not an ASP.NET label? There's two different labels, right? There's, the, there's this label. Yeah. There's this label, and there's that. Well, the answer is the ASP labels are prefixed by ASP colon. That's how you can tell whether something's an ASP.NET control or an HTML tag. Now, I believe that that label is not going to translate to an HTML label tag, oddly enough. Uh, in fact, I'll put a, a little test in here, and we'll see what it translates to. I believe the ASP label tag translates to a span as opposed to a label. All right, which means that if you want to use elect, uh, um, you, you want to use uh, uh, accessibility for this, and you want to make your form truly accessible, you would need to go and not use the ASP.NET label. You instead use the HTML label and and do the association. I bring this up again because it's important to know and to realize what your ASP.NET controls translate to as far as HTML and, and CSS. And let me just verify that, then I'll take out that ASP.NET label. I go and look at this, notice that, that the ASP.NET label actually trans, uh, uh, transforms in, into a span tag and not a label tag. All right, so therefore I'd have to use a label um, tag in HTML to truly achieve that accessibility. Accessibility is something that, that's important to me. I don't think a lot of web developers know tons about it. And nor pay a lot of attention to it. And therefore, I think it's my job to sort of um, try to make people aware of that. All right. Let me stop debug. I'm going to go now and add radio buttons. And I'm going to do this in design view because it's a little more straightforward to, to do it in design view than it is uh, to do it in code view. Again, as I mentioned, over time you'll sort of learn what things are easier for you to do via design view and what things are easier for you to do via code view. Now, actually you do not, you do not select a radio button to create a group of radio buttons. You select a radio button list. So I'll go and I'll pop that over there. I will pop over to the source view to make sure that it's in the spot that I expect it, which it is. And I can then go and, and edit some of the attributes of it. One of the things I can do is I can edit the items in this radio button group or radio button list. 
In this case, I can go and add and add the first item to be dine in and I'll make the value D just for simplicity. And I'll go and click add and I will make the text for this carry out and I will make the value C. Now, all these sort of controls that allow you to select from options have associated with them typically text and a value. Whereas the text is what the user sees and the value is sort of the value of the control sort of behind the scenes. <clears throat> Keep in mind in this case C or T might not be, uh, or C or, or D might not be immediately obvious to someone what that means, carry out, dine in or whatever. So you put the English, you know, the full English description there and behind the scenes the program is going to expect to do that. This will have important implications later on in the course when we start tying these things to databases, right? Because when we tie this to database, let's say instead of a, a radio button for um, dine in or carry out, this is a radio button for the majors that a student could take in college. Whereas you pick a major from a list of so many majors. Well that list of majors very well could be in a database table. And that database table might have a primary key that's just a number. Maybe one is CIS, two is accounting, three is business administration, and so on. Well, students aren't going to know what one means or what five means or whatever. So you need to put the explanation in text of what it means and then, but behind the scenes, the application needs that value of that primary key. All right. So it's pretty common in this case to have those two things. The one thing that the user is going to see that's going to make sense from the user's perspective and then what the code needs sort of behind the scenes. All right. I could go and default one of them if I wanted to. All right. In other words, whichever one was typically the case, you know, I could default it and that way I wouldn't have to change it. I'm not going to select a default here though because I want to actually validate this, uh, this uh, um, radio button. And we'll see how to do that in a second. All right. There are other attributes. I can orient the radio buttons vertically or horizontally. Alright. Now, let's go in and create our drop down list. Very similar, we can edit the items. And we can do the same thing here. We can add items. And again, there's going to be a text and, and a value. I'm going to actually add another one, the top item, that will say select quality of service. And I will leave no value for that. This is sort of a dummy option and what this will do is this will allow us to write validation code to validate that because we, they can't leave it on that option. All right. Otherwise, we couldn't write validation code, right? Because all four of the original ones that I had there were valid choices. So I couldn't validate for that. But now this is sort of a dummy choice and if the user stays on this, I know that there's a problem. Now, I want to go and put that at the top. I can use these arrows to reposition 
those. Okay. Uh, you could, but uh, the default in HTML is if you don't explicitly say selected, the top item on the list is considered to be selected. So, um, yeah, I, I could do that. Or, or again, just the fact that it's the first one on the list is, is good enough. So now we can go and run this and we can look at it. And here we have our drop down, our radio button, and our text box. If we look at the HTML that got generated, we'll see exactly what it came up with. Actually, it didn't like the fact that I left it blank. It filled that in with that. So I'll go back and change that to an S. Now we're going to put some validation controls on here. And let's, let's again, let's validate these uh, one at a time. First one I want to, uh, well, let's put my button on here as well. All right, there we go. Give the text to calculate. All right. So, I'm going to put a required field validator in there because they have to put something in there. So, I'll go over and I will drag a required field validator over. And... When I create a required field validator, I can specify the error message, you know, must enter amount. And I also have to specify what control to validate. And what I want to validate is I want to validate txt food, so I pick that one. Right? Because it doesn't know. Just because physically it is next to that other one doesn't mean that that's the one I'm validating. It would surely be very horrible design to have the error message next to another control, but hey, you know, you have to explicitly say what control you're validating here. The other validation that we're going to use um, here is a range validator. And the range validator uh, validates that the, the value is within a certain allowable range. All right. We mentioned in this case that I wanted to make sure that the, 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 the value was between 0 and um, 100. So I'll go in and I'll say, for my error message, I'll say must enter between 0 and 100. Control to validate. It's again, it's the txt food. Now this one gets me at least a few times a semester because maximum value is on top of minimum value because they go in alphabetical order and MA comes before MI. So I'll put in a minimum value of 0.01, maximum value of 99.99, let's say, if I wanted it to be not, uh, not inclusive between uh, 0 and 100. The other thing we have to do is we have to say that we're talking about numbers here that we're validating. Okay? Um, the reason for that is that the um, sequence for determining if, if something is between two other values is different if you're talking about strings than if you're talking about numbers. Right? In other words, if you're comparing two strings, all right, then... Two, or yeah, two is not between the string one one zero and, or I'm sorry, the string two is not between the string one and one zero, right? In other words, if we're comparing strings, if I have a string with one in it, 
and I'll put quotes around it to indicate it's a string. And if I have a string with one zero around it, two is not between those two. Two is actually greater than that. Why? Because strings are, al are, are alphabetized following like phone book alphabet alphabetization rules. In other words, you look at the first character first. All right? And in this case, two is greater than the first character of this, so therefore that's considered to be greater than that. Whereas obviously numerically, if you tell it that it's a number, then two will fit right neatly between one and ten. All right, so it's important for you to go and get the right data type. If, you're, if, you, if you use one of these validation controls and it doesn't seem to be working right, that's definitely something to look at, that you've defined the correct type, because otherwise it's going to be uh, evaluating it based on the wrong rules. All right. Let's go and make sure this piece of it works. And again, I'm not going to be terribly concerned about styling of this, at least not now. Uh, we may come back and, and style it more later. All right. Let's go and run this. And if I click that, it tells me I must enter amount. If I enter garbage, it actually does sort of a data type check as well. You get sort of get that one for free with the range type. And if I enter in a number that's outside of the range, I get the error. Whereas if I enter something that's correct and within the range, it goes through. All right. So we've covered... Let's see how many of these we have covered. As far as validation controls go, we have um, covered the compare validator. If we remember last time, we, we used a compare validator to compare the type of something to make sure that our answer in the math quiz was a number. You can also use a compare validator to compare two fields. For example, maybe date two has to be after date one. All right. We have not used a custom validator. A custom validator sort of allows you to hook in your own custom JavaScript if none of these other validation controls work for you. All right. A range validator we just used. Regular expression validator I think we used when we validated an email address. All right, we put that in there. That uh, regular expression validator is when your valid entries match some pattern, like a social security number is a certain number of digits, dash, certain number of digits, dash, four more digits. A phone number is a certain pattern, an email address is a certain pattern. And a required field validator, again, of course, make sure that you've put something in there. We even talked about the validation summary that allows you to go and put your errors in a, in a different spot. So we've fairly well covered validation. All right. Now I want to go and I want to validate that they've checked one of these two. All right. And I can do that with the required field validator. And I will say must select dine in or carry out. All right. What am I validating? The radio button list. What is the initial value of this? If none of them are selected, there is no initial value, so I will leave that blank. All right. Let's sure, make sure this works now. So if I go and I type something in here, if I leave it blank, I get an error. If I select one or the other, I'm okay. All right, so we validated that. This initial value is going to become important too when we look at the drop down. All right, so the last thing we want to validate is the drop down. We want to make sure that they've picked something other than the first dummy option that says select quality of service. So I'll go again and I will add a required field validator to that. And I will say, you know, must make a selection or some sort of, of user-friendly error message. I will say the control to validate is the drop-down. And I will say the initial value here is S. 
because if you remember I made the value of that dummy option at the beginning of the list, I made this value equal to S. So since that's the initial value, if it's still on S when they submit it, that means that it's, it's not valid. All right? Okay. So we should have our validation set. Let's run this and make sure it all works. We tested the other two. Notice I'm going back and retesting it, even though in theory <laughs> something I did there shouldn't have an effect. It, it never hurts you to, to go uh, and test this. All right. Um, the nice thing, though, is, is based on the way that I build it, you know, I tested the one, did a little bit of coding, tested the one, did a little bit more, tested the other, and so on down the line. The other thing that's good, is, as we talked about before, is the fact that I'm using these built-in components, I can maybe, um, my testing is going to be a little different for them than compared to code that I've written myself from scratch. Um, I really just have to make sure that I've wired those controls right, right? That I've put the validator associated with the right control, that I've chosen the, the correct data type for that c control, and so on down the line, all right? So, again, if I were writing this from scratch, I might do a little more extensive testing, just because, you know, I have to shake out all the errors. Here, I'm not saying you can skip the testing part, but... Since you're using a built-in component, the assumption is, is that there has already been some sort of uh, testing applied to it. And really what you're doing is making sure you're, you've hooked up that component right, that you're using it in the proper manner. All right. Now we're going to get to the calculation of this. All right. Um, what we want to do, again, is we want to do two little calculations. We want to, based on what they've chosen for... Uh, Dine-in versus carry-out, we want to charge sales tax or not. And then based on what they have answered for the tip, we want to give them a tip or not. All right? So, let's go and do that. That will be, of course, in the code behind file. So I'll double-click that to get over here. Now, one thing I mentioned last time, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate it here, I'll probably repeat it every time we do one of these code behinds for a button, is my first statement in here is going to be if is valid. All right. So I'm going to recall the reasoning behind this. Why do I say if is valid? Case JavaScript is disabled, right? Those validator controls, remember, run both on the client and on the server. So, if it's a normal browser and JavaScript is enabled, when I run this page, those errors are caught on the client side and it never makes it back to the server. So, if I go and run this, all right, if I type something in here and click Submit, it's going to be hard to tell, but you're going to notice nothing going on down there. Didn't make it to the server. My response is immediate, right? Which is generally how you'd want validation to work, right? You know, you, you don't want to burden the server with data that's bad, and you want to give your user immediate feedback. So it didn't go back to the server. Now, if I were to disable JavaScript, those controls then fire again on the server side. And if it caught an error, what we want to do is, if there's an error, we want to catch it before it calculates it again. All right? Because if there's no value in there, there's no point going in and trying to do the calculation. You know? It'll give either erroneous or misleading results. So I'm going to put that at the top of virtually every one of my uh, button click events. All right? And again... If we have JavaScript enabled, which in most cases you will, all right, um, it will, um, 
you know, it'll just be doing those checks redundantly. And if it passed on the client, it'll pass on the server and it'll go and execute that. This is really sort of a fail safe just in case that, that uh, client side scripting is disabled, all right, in which case um, the controls also fire off on the server side and it'll catch the errors that way. Did it, here, here's, a, here's a question for you. Did anyone disable JavaScript yesterday for any reason? It might sound like an odd question. Did you? I, I didn't, but I noticed like Wikipedia. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of folks, what they were doing is in order to view Wikipedia pages, uh, if you disable JavaScript, and if anyone tried Wikipedia yesterday protesting the, the Copyright Act, Wikipedia um, didn't display pages. What it effectively did is it displayed the page and then it displayed sort of an overlay on top of it. That was all done via JavaScript. If you turned off JavaScript, actually, that wouldn't have kicked in and you could have viewed your Wikipedia pages. So there you go. So there's, there's reason to do it at least once in a while. Um, again, there, there's people that would do it for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the reasons aren't important. Because people can do it, you want to make sure that you are addressing it. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to start doing my calculation and I'm going to declare some variables. Now, um, please, you know, if you see Paul Nora, don't tell him that I've not set option strict and option explicit on. All right. If any of you have taken this course, that's a good idea to do. But again, that currently isn't a prerequisite for this course. So I don't want to confuse folks that have not done Visual Basic. All right. Um, we validated it, so we know we're getting a number by the time we make it here. So I can fairly comfortably do that and just make sure I don't tell Paul that I've done it. All right. So I'm going to declare a couple variables. Um, and hopefully I'll use VB syntax and not Java syntax, which is my Monday and Wednesday class. Dim uh, food cost as double dim tip cost as double dim sales tax as double dim total cost as double. Now, do you have to declare all these variables? No. You could do this without declaring these variables and, and it would work just fine. But sometimes sort of the, the, the long way around and explicitly declaring things makes the code a little more readable. So bear with me. If you can do it in fewer instructions, good for you. It probably ultimately doesn't matter all that much. I would rather make my code slightly more readable even if it takes a microsecond longer to execute. All right. Yeah, uh, exactly. And again, I, a lot of things vary. And again, my assumption here is, is I, I have to assume rather that not all of you have necessarily had VB to learn some things like constants and stuff like that. So I'm going to kind of take a, uh, uh, you know, a, a different uh, way of doing it. And maybe we'll talk about some of the better ways to do it. But yeah, I'm going to go by step by step and do this. Now, I can start off by saying food cost equals... And I'm going to get that from the text box, right? Which is called txt food. But remember, it's not enough to say txt food. txt food is a text box. It's an object. And that object has all sorts of properties associated with it. It has a width. It has a height. It has a size. It has a CSS class. It has, well, press a dot. And we can see all the things that it has. All right? We're not interested in anything except the value of that. And the value of it is found in the text property. The point is, is I can't simply say food cost equals txt food because txt food is an object. I have to pick the specific property I want. Now, if How can I tell if it was uh, uh, carry out or dine in? I can tell based on the radio button, right? So, how do I ask 
access that radio button? Well, I give the name of the radio button list, which is radio button list 1, dot. There's not a text value for this like there is for a text box, but there is a selected value. All right. What is a selected value? The selected value of a radio button is oops, the value of whatever item was selected. So if the value of that radio button control is D, that means it's dine in. If the value of that radio button control is C, it means carry out. So I can go in here and say, if the selected value equals D for dine in, then sales tax equals food cost times what's the sales tax in this county? 6 1 7 5? Okay. Now, could we do better than this? Could we put that in a constant? Yeah, we absolutely could. Or better yet, we could have a, uh, a, um, uh, a class that, that has some of these constants in it and access those. So yeah, we can do better than this. Um, I am going to go and make sure that I comment this and say, oops. and say sales tax in Ohio as of is all right. Excellent question. Let me rephrase the question so people watching the video can hear it. The question was is, I have an if statement in here that says if the value equals D, then sales tax rate equals whatever, and I do the calculation. The question was, couldn't I do this? Couldn't I go in here, edit items, and make the value of dine-in the amount of the sales tax rate, 0 0.06175, and then the value for carry out would be zero. All right. Could I do that? And the answer is you could. All right. Of course you could. You know, the question is, is that a good idea? Why do we think that's a good idea or not a good idea? Yes? Uh, I don't think it's a good idea because it's not right in the code. Oh. Okay. Yes? Okay. Well, playing the, devil's, playing the devil's advocate, you'd have to do that here, too. But you have to do it the way I'm coding it this way, too. It's not so much as in, the, if you change in the code, you're changing the one spot. If you change it, say, 6.75, whatever, right. you'd be changing it in two different places. Well, no, if we... What if you were tying this in to a database or something? What if the value be whatever it is that you're grabbing from the database? Um, it, well, it, it depends on, on how you do it, um, as, as far as that goes. Um, it could be, or there could, there, you could be grabbing the D from the database. There could be a database table that would have the type of, you know, the type of, of bill it is, and then uh, a sales tax rate associated with it. So you could either pull one or the other. Um, actually, the point of changing it in two places isn't necessarily true, because if I... If I go and if I make this value for dine-in, if I make that 0 0.06175, then actually I can get by without an if statement, right? Right. Because I would say 
than sales tax equals food cost times that. Okay? And I wouldn't even need an if statement then. And then I could just change it in the drop down. Or I'm sorry, not the drop down, but the radio button, and I wouldn't have to change it. Any other opinions on this matter before I weigh in with, with my view on it? That's a possibility if there were other things that happened based on that, that value. That could make the code awkward to read, for example. Um, I would say that that's not a good idea. Um, not to say that, that uh, any of the answers you folks gave didn't have validity here, but the reason I would say that's not a good idea is you're combining sort of business logic and the user interface. Okay. Um, Ideally, that sales tax rate shouldn't exist on a drop down or on a radio button in there. It should come from a business logic class that you're going to have. You create a custom class that's going to contain, um, you know, tax rates or something like that. The idea is to as great a degree as possible that you can separate, all right, the user interface to what I call the business logic rules, the better off you're going to be. And that is, that's mixing too much, that, that's mixing those two things together, mixing the business logic with the user interface. It would be better to have in your user interface, you make the choice, then you go and you ask an object, or you ask a class, given this kind of meal, what was the sales tax rate? Now, we're not doing that yet in here. We're going to build to that sort of, of coding here. But, again, the reason I would say it's, it's bad is, again, you want to keep, you know, they talk about tiers and applications, an interface tier, a, a data tier, a business logic tier. You want to keep things on the same tier, on, on the right tier. You don't want to mi uh, mix up business logic or data with, the user interface. Think of it like separating your, you know, it's, it's analogous to separating your CSS to your HTML, right? To the degree that you can do that, you can change one easily without changing another, all right? Some people are alluding to this. What if you had another page on your site that calculated sales tax? Well, if that's baked into the user interface, it would have to be baked into every single page, whereas ultimately, we would want that to live in one place so that we could ask that uh, question of a class or whatever, and, and we could get it that way. So if it wasn't for the, you know, if, uh, other than that, it would work just as well as the coding I'm having here. In some ways, it would even be more straightforward, as you've, you, as you've said. But the problem is, is we want to make sure that to as great a degree as possible that we're going to separate our business logic from our user interface logic. Um, we're not there yet, obviously. Obviously, we're still doing that because our user interface logic, you, you know, our code behind file has business rules built into it, all right? But we're going to move in that direction with this example as we go forward. Remember, this is just the first pass of, of what we're going through. So, great question. Um, again, you know, that would work well, but we want to, again, not just have a program that works, but have a program that works following good practices and more maintainable and have a clean separation between the different components. All right, great question. Um, lastly, we will have a similar thing um, where we could ask if drop down list one dot selected value equals, well, uh, we could do this. We could say tip value or tip cost equals zero. And then if the selection was average, then what did I say? Tip cost equals food cost times 
0.15%. Otherwise, if it is equal to, what did I say, excellent, then we give a 20%. Lastly, I would go and I would say total cost equals food cost plus sales tax plus tip cost. And then the one thing I forgot to do is put a label here um, to put the answer. And I could say label one dot text equals total cost. And I could run this and have some scenarios and say, let's say we have $50 and we had carry out and the service is not applicable, the total amount is $50, which would expect. If it was dine in and there was poor service, it should be $50 plus the 6%, so it would be 53 and change. But it's not. Pardon me? Okay. Okay, what did I do wrong here? Okay. That sure looked to me like it should work, right? Now, again, keep in mind, anytime in this class I make a mistake, I've done it for a reason. And that reason is I want to demonstrate debugger, all right? I didn't really realize I wanted to demonstrate debugger, but I think my subconscious mind made some mistakes, so I could test that. What is debugger? All right. I ran this, and I didn't get the results I expected. All right. I think I did it right. All right. Now, there, there's a couple of choices you could have in trying to figure it out. One is you could stare at it and look at it again, and look at it again, and look at it again. That works sometimes. All right, sometimes the fifth time you look at something, it's like the little light bulb goes off, ah. All right, but it doesn't always work. And it is the long path around. What debugger allows you to do is look and see exactly what code's being executed. So you can trace through and see systematically and make sure that your ifs are going the way that you expect them and so on. So to run it in debug mode, what you can do is you can click here and set what's called a breakpoint. What a breakpoint is, is when it reaches that, when the code reaches that, this screen's going to pop up and we can walk through and see each instruction being executed in turn. And we can look at the values of variables and we can make sure stuff is the way that we expect it to. Obviously something isn't the way I expected it because I'm not getting the right result. So obviously I need to look at something and see what's wrong. So let's go and let me click stop. And let me run it. All right. Dine in. $50. Service I said was poor. I click calculate. All right. I'm now you know, doing an MRI of this code. I'm seeing the guts of the code as I'm going through. And it's on this statement. That's what the little yellow arrow means. That's my break point. That's where it stops. And if I put my mouse over variables, I can see their value. In this case, is valid is true. So one possible problem, unlikely, but possible, is somehow that variable had the wrong value and it was, wasn't hitting those lines of code. I can then walk through the instructions a line at a time, and I'm going to use the F11 key to step into. And that will go in and execute each statement in turn. All right. Food cost equals that, okay. It actually shows you the value before the instruction executes. So right now, food cost has a value of zero because this statement hasn't executed yet, all right, and we haven't assigned it yet. In addition to hovering my mouse over it, I can go into intermediate, I'm sorry, not intermediate, but immediate mode, 
And if I type in question mark food cost, it shows me the value of it that way too. All right. So I can hit F11 again. And now food cost has a value of that. All right. Has a value of 50. Now, I expect this if statement to be true. All right. Ah, when you had asked the question about that, I changed the value from D to 0 0.016, you know. I guess that's one if I would have looked at, I would have recognized it. But it's good to do it systematically. A um, couple observations that I'll make, uh, you know, and, and then we'll, we'll wrap up uh, for today. Number one is, is my experience, again, even with, with people that have been programming a while, that they're not systematic enough in terms of testing and debugging. You need a test plan. And one thing that we could talk about for this case, uh, for, for this particular thing is, even though it's simple, how many test cases would we really need to test to make sure everything in here works? It actually would be a fair number, right? We should enter in with nothing in the amount box. Enter in with too low a value in the amount box, enter in with too high a value in the, the, the box, enter in with garbage in the amount box. That's four test cases, and we haven't even gotten into one that's actually going to calculate yet. We could then test with something selected in the radio button, something not selected, something selected in the drop down, something not selected, and then so on, and go from there. Come, you know, each of the tip types that we could select in each of the uh, dine-in versus carry-out. So really, to test this thoroughly, now you could combine some of those scenarios together, but to really test this thoroughly, you'd probably need a dozen or so turns through it to, to test it thoroughly. And a lot of people, and that's why you get buggy software, they make assumptions and they think, well, okay, that'll work, or I changed this, I didn't touch this piece of code, so it should work. You know, those are famous last words. You know, I've heard that so many times in my career. I, you know, I, of course that's going to work. I didn't touch that. Well, you don't know till you test. All right. The other thing is to be systematic in the way that you debug, as opposed to just staring at it. You know, if you stare at it and you don't see the answer, there's a good chance staring at it longer won't help. Either ask someone else, get a second set of eyes on it, or again, the other thing is take a, a systematic approach. All right, let's go and now that that's okay, I can say stop debugging. I'm going to go and remove my breakpoint, correct that. Wrong one. I'll go change that and now we'll make sure that that works and we'll call it a day. So we said $50. Dine in. Let's say poor service. That should this should be 53 and change. And sure enough, 53 and change. All right. Questions about any of this? Yes. Just uh, out of curiosity, why did you make a table? Why did I make a table? Well, actually, I did make a table. Yeah, you, you did. But I'm just no, I didn't. <laughs> I, I made a list. I made a list item. Why did I do that? Because that's probably the easiest way to organize all the data in a form. Um, if you still have access, if you go to uh, like the example in 216 where we covered forms, that's a very easy way that you can style it as a list item. Tables. Um, really limit what you can do. So the other option for, or an other option for this, is to do your forms in tables, where you have a row, or I'm sorry, you have a column for the labels and a column for the form element. But I think you get a lot more flexibility with it if you make it a list, uh, an unordered list and list items, as far as the styling goes. I didn't really take the styling far enough to show that, but if you really want to go back and look, uh, or we can talk about it in lab or next time. All right. Other questions. All right, now, you might say to yourself, all right, I'm done with this. Well, not exactly.
although this code works, it's very limited. In other words, this code lives on that button, all right? which means that that code can only be run when we click that button. All right? Now there very well might be other places in our application we want to invoke this code. All right? That's what we'll talk about next week. All right? Here we have code that works, I'm assuming, all right, once we, we debugged it, it works, but it's still not what I would classify as good code. So we'll talk about what would make this code better next time. All right?